Okay, then, hello and welcome. This talk will try to summarize uh, the problems, the interesting problems we stumbled upon during our kernel testing for the last 10 years. And then it will try to describe the solution we, are, we either uh, developed or we are trying to build at the moment. And the first thing is, why do we have to even think about uh, having something special for the kernel. And the reason is that the kernel test cases are special in several ways. So if something goes wrong, it can easily crash the system. That's kind of obvious, right? But if uh, there are test cases that can actually crash or reboot the, test, uh, the system under the test, and that's the expected behavior. So that is something that is less expected and has to be handled somehow. And obviously, uh, stress test might stress the system to the point it will stop responding for a while, which happens quite a lot with these kind of test cases. And if you ever attempt to test hardware, you will need to propagate the information how the hardware is set up, connected, and so on, how it looks like to the test cases. And of course, there are tests that actually corrupt the machine enough so it does not boot anymore. This is mostly the case for the reproducers because if there is bug in the file system and the fuzzer finds it, it rewrites the super blog or something and you are done. <coughs> and of course, the kernel is large, so we get requests to run uh, subsets of the test cases based on some functionality. The, in the ideal world, we would have the kernel patch, we would run some magic on that, and then select test cases based on uh, the magic. So we will have a smoke test for each kernel commit that would select small, reasonably small set of test cases. So the underlying theme of the presentation will be how to make the software that runs the test cases smarter because um, not much have, have happened in that regard for the last, I don't know, 15 years. <clears throat> we started with something that would, just, that would be just the shell script that executes test cases in one after another, and when it finishes, it finishes. And uh, we added quite a lot of functionality. Now we can capture log and do more interesting stuff. But still, the test runner is not nearly smart enough to solve most of these problems. So what are the solutions? There are actually two solutions for the problems I wrote before. First solution is kind of something you would think of reasonably easily, and that is that the software that keeps the state about the test executed has to be separated from the actual machine that is running the test cases. That's, I would say that is obvious, but it's not the case for the most of the frameworks out there. And we, we do that, and it's kind of easy for the VMs. You have a VM, you just spin a VM and talk to the, to the VM through Weird.io somehow. And if it crashes, it crashes. If it corrupts the file system, it corrupts the file system, it just spin another one. Uh, but it's more complicated for the bare metal test cases. You have to talk to BMC or what, whatever is there to control the, the hardware. But that's not, not uh, all. We have to make the test runner smarter as well so that it knows what to expect. Because currently the test cases are handled as kind of the black boxes. You have an executable, you run it and then wait for it to finish. And we actually started to work on something that is able to take the requirements and limitations from the test cases and store it into the <coughs> format that is readable by the test runner so that the test runner can do much more educated guesses and decisions. So we propagate the information from the test to the test runner and the solution is called metadata in LTP. So each LTP test case is described by a C structure, which a lot of, there is a lot of stuff in there, a lot of flags that describe what the particular test is going to do. And that is during the build, these test cases are being parsed, 
and uh, we build a big JSON file that describes these test cases. And actually, it has been used for, uh, I guess, a year or so, and we solved a few problems already, already. And when you have the recent enough LTP, when you type make and make install, the JSON file is installed alongside the test cases now. So how does it look like? So we have a structure that is describing the test, and during the build, it's more or less translated one to one into the JSON. And we have di different constraints in there. We have different uh, limitations, and we are <coughs> going to enhance the structure and then a few more so that we can fix the problems I sketched at the start. And really, it's, it's, it's that simple. You just take the test structure, you parse the fields, and you export that as a JSON, and there is a big array of the test cases in the JSON. So the first problem we solved with that is how to quickly recover from crashes. Because uh, test runner for the kernel has to figure out if the test machine has been stuck or not. And uh, all kinds of different stuff can happen, and it's not really easy to figure out when the machine is really stuck or not. And this is impossible to do quickly if you have no idea for how long the test cases are supposed to run. So one of the first things we added to the metadata was max runtime for the test cases, and the majority of the test cases actually run a fraction of the second, for a fraction of the second. And we have quite a few that run for longer, so we annotated all the test cases that run for longer than a fraction of the second with the max runtime. So the test runner has no, now has an upper bound for how long the test cases are supposed to run. And if that is exceeded significantly, you can say that the machine got stuck and you can reboot it. And for majority of the test cases, it's a quarter of a second. So if the machine stops responding for a few, few seconds, it's stuck. So we can reboot or re restart the machine quite quickly now, because before we had that, we had the default uh, maximal runtime that was upper bound for the longest running test case. So if you had a test case that crashed the machine in a second, the test platform, the framework was waiting for a half an hour to declare it stuck. And that's not optimal at all. You are wasting a lot of resources that way. So, of course, the solution is not perfect because there are always test cases that do not have upper bound for how long they are going to run. And these are mostly the OO memory test cases that are triggering trashing. And then when the machine starts trashing, you never know how long it will take for it to recover or if, if it will recover at all. So there will be always some corner cases where this not, does not apply, but it solved the problem for 99% of the test cases. Okay, another thing that we are trying to solve right now is how to inform the uh, test runner that the test case is going to crash or reboot the system. Because we have syscalls that are currently untested, like reboot or kexec, we also have sysrq trigger that is not being tested, hardware injection like M MC test cases, when we inject the hardware errors to the kernel and expect the kernel to crash in certain way. And this is not really possible to be automated reasonably right now. So the solution uh, for this problem is that we will add the metadata and inform the test runner that the test case is, is test case is going to reboot or crash the system, and then the test will be executed in two phases. First, uh, would do whatever crashes or reboots the system, and the second phase would be executed once the test runner recovers the machine, and uh, the second phase would do analysis on the results and report the results. And we might also need to pass some data from the test runner uh, like the capture uh, of the DMSG or crash dump or uh, whatever is supposed to be produced. So this will be slightly more complicated than just running the test. We will have to capture something in the test runner as well. And the idea is that we will 
add to uh, flags to the TST test structure. If you remember the C structure at the beginning, we will add more flags there. It will get uh, exported to the JSON file, and then the test runner will just uh, handle the reboot or the crash. And actually, most of the code is in the test runner already because it has to be able to recover for, from crash anyways. It just needs to know which test cases are going to crash the kernel on purpose. And the same goes for, for the reboot, because the way you recover from crash is that you, you turn off the machine, turn on and get again, and wait for it to boot. So mostly the code is there and running and working. We just need to add the metadata to make the test runner smarter. And once that is done, we can finally test the reboot syscall in the kernel. OK, so. <clears throat> there is also a problem that uh, some test cases might stress the system to the point that it will stop responding. This is not about the having metadata and making things smarter. This is about making things smaller and less likely to get stuck. So the idea is that at the start I said that the part that keeps the state uh, of the test cases being executed in, is in the different machine than the uh, than the machine that is being uh, actually tested. So we have uh, one machine, possibly VM, running somewhere that is talking to the machine under the test. And currently, systems like that usually SSH to that system and run test cases under bash, which is not optimal, because when the system is under the stress and starts swapping or something, the bash will not respond. So the idea is to have a small binary the, that has a very simple job that talks over uh, possibly serial line. I do not think that is a good idea to talk through the network socket because there is much more code involved and the serial line is probably more foolproof. And the small binary would be locked in the memory and would have real-time priority uh, so that you will have a good chance that you can talk to that binary even when the system is trashing or on the load or whatever is happening in there. And we actually have a prototype for that. Uh, it's called LTX. Uh, it's in the GitHub upstream for LTP. And that is exactly what, what we are aiming for. It's a small binary that has simple protocol that allows you execute stuff and collect the results. It can cause also collect the DMSGO and stuff like that and send it back to whatever is running on the other side. I hope to get that finished uh, till the end of the year so we can finally uh, get that problem fixed. And also, uh, I've been experimenting with uh, hardware test cases. I started with something simple, so again, serial line. And uh, with, I started to play it with something that is uh, called serial loop, so that you have a physical cable connected to two serial ports. And uh, for that, you have to propagate the information, how things are connected from the test executor to the test cases. Uh, either it has to be hard-coded in the test executor somewhere, or for a bigger labs, they have some kind of database in somewhere, and you would ask the database for the data to be handed to the test runner and then hand it to the test case. And the idea is to have uh, identifier, unique identifier, and for the serial loop, it's simply string serial loop, and if the test tests sets this flag, uh, then the test executor will know that it has to look up if the machine that the test cases are executing, executing on has a serial loop installed and send the bit of JSON with the description which port is it connected to and what is supported there, like speeds and so on, and send it to the test case. The test case would parse that information and run the test cases accordingly. And I actually had a prototype of that, but unfortunately it's not finished and it's not upstream. I should really return to that uh, once again and try to finish it so we have at least something 
in, in the upstream that people can look at and start similar test cases based on that. And I have a, quite a few ideas that could be actually implemented easily once that is done. For instance, for the audio. Uh, the idea is that we will have an audio loop. That means that the output from the sound card will be connected to the input. And you would beep uh, some defined frequency to the output, record that, and then run Fourier uh, transformation on that and look if there is the right peak at the right place. Uh, and that would actually check if the audio is running reasonably fine. And the same for the uh, video, actually, because these days you can really buy cheap USB devices that at one point are grabbing video like uh, video cameras, USB video cameras, but instead of a camera, it has, it has HDMI port. So you would just basically do a loop back from the video card to that grabber. And then you can do the same. Uh, the idea is to have a simple DRM, uh, open the graphic card and paint it wall in red, for instance. And then on the other side, you would check that the whole picture is in red. And there is probably much more that could be done this way. But the main problem is that we do not have enough time to explore something like that. OK, and then there is a one problem that is mostly unsolved for the bare metal because, as, as I said at the start, some test cases might corrupt the file system enough so that the machine does not boot anymore. And this is easily solved, solved for the VMs because we actually can do snapshotting. So you take the whole virtual machine, you take a snapshot, and then whatever you do, you can revert to that state. And we use that for fast reboots in OpenQA already. So for virtual machines, this is not a big problem. But for the bare metal, it's not really easily solvable because you probably need a full reinstallation or a second disk that would be mirroring the first one and you would somehow copy the whole disk or whatever. OK, and that leads me to and the part about running the subset for the particular subsystem or functionality. And as I said, running whole LTP takes more than half an hour. And if you want to smoke test your patch, it's probably not a reasonable solution for that. So if you want to get quick feedback, you would have to select some subset of test cases. And we would need some kind of heuristic, which subsystem maps to which test cases. And actually, they have something like that in Red Hat. They have a script that is looking at the files that the patch is touching. And they are trying to select something uh, based on that, some test cases based on that. And the point I would like to make is that it does not have to be perfect. If it works 80% of time, that's good enough. So if, if we had something like that, uh, we could be uh, plugging LTP into the kernel CI easily. If we manage to limit the test runs to five minutes, it's probably OK. And nobody would notice the difference. And currently, what we do in LTP, we have a few handpicked subset of different run test files. And the run test file is really just what it says. It's a file that is filled with the test case binaries uh, op with optional options, and these are executed by the test executor. So we, for instance, have a file for system 5 uh, IPC that selects, ma that has manually written in all the system 5 IPC test cases. And the, my plan is to actually get rid of these run test files completely, because once we have the metadata in JSON, we have more complete picture in the data, we can filter that out easily. <laughs> so yes, the idea is use the metadata to generate the subset of test cases. And we pretty much have all information there now. Uh, the, <laughs> the main problem is that the mm, uh, metadata are generated for the test cases that have been rewritten to the new test library that has the nice structure. 
and we still have something like 30% of the old test cases that needs to be rewritten. So until that happens, it's, it will probably not, not be uh, ideal to convert that because we will have some test cases that would have to be maintained manually outside of that system. So I really hope that we will rewrite, rewrite the rest of the test cases and finally switch to this, gener this generation. And yeah, what I said, we can, we have uh, manually uh, maintained the file with all the System 5 IPC uh, functionality, test cases. And actually, uh, all that we would have to do instead is to write down the list of the syscalls that uh, we test for the System 5 IPC. And once we have the list of the syscalls, which is much smaller than list of the, all the test cases. We could match that into metadata and generate the list of the test cases for that group of syscalls. And if, if we start working on that system, uh, you can see that we can get uh, to the point where we have identified a subsystem in kernel, and based on that, we can select the group of syscalls or functionality to test, and from that, generate a list of the test cases. At least that's the idea. And there are all kinds of queries we can do. Uh, I suppose that we could even have some uh, reasonably, uh, <coughs> reasonably small uh, language with expression where you could write whatever you want to select. So for instance, if we want to run all the regression test cases, these are tagged with CVE or Linux Git tag because all the LTP test cases these days if, if these are regression tests, they have in the metadata a Linux git tag, and it points out to the commit that actually fixed the regression. So if you want to run regression test cases, you just can say run everything that has the Linux git tag included. Or if we want to run quick test cases, we would filter out everything that has large max runtime or anything like that. You can think of really, really a lot of things to filter out based on this. So this, this is my presentation. This is the end. And if you have any question, please go ahead. So we have one online question from Santiago. Would the hardware logs and the grabbers be integrated into OpenQE? Because we have something similar, but works bare metal RPI with sound and video. May <laughs> yes, the, the, the thing is that uh, this presentation is about the LTP upstream. And my idea is to have the test cases that are independent of any test runner so that we have defined API between the test cases and the test runner, like the uh, serial loop. So once we have defined API, you can possibly run these test cases anywhere once you learn your test execution framework to generate the right data for the test cases. So this is actually trying to be agnostic of the test execution platform. Uh, uh, maybe a follow-up question. Uh, uh, I know that there was a, or there is a tool called uh, Run LTP NG, and that's that's obsolete as well, right? Because yeah. we have a Kirk now. Okay. And were you talking about Kirk or or because you spoke about some SSH uh, about well. Yeah, working with remote machines, so, so that was about Kirk. Uh, actually, this is how most of the framework I have seen works like, because that's the most obvious way, just to SSH to the machine and run stuff. Okay. Uh, and the Kirk uh, is trying to be the reference implementation for the stuff I've been talking about. So you have a test cases, you have well-defined API between test cases and the test executor, and then you have reference test executor implementation in the upstream, and from that point, you can do whatever you want with the test cases in your system. 
as long as you, we have well-defined API, you should be able to modify stuff reasonably easily and look the test cases in whatever you have. I see. Thank you. Okay, I guess everyone is hungry, so 